So I'm talking to Seth Lloyd of MIT, a quantum mechanic at MIT. Um, Seth, we're going to talk about quantum computers, but could you just give us the big background? You know, there was the quantum revolution in understanding at the start of the 20th century. Give us a sense of the backdrop and why that was so revolutionary. Well, quantum mechanics is a branch of physics that describes things at their most fundamental level. And the great discovery made uh, at the, the turn of the uh, 19th to 20th century was that quantum mechanics makes the world digital, discrete. Energy comes in chunks, but we know from computing that information also comes in chunks. Bits, the distinction between yes or no, zero or one, true or false. And so because quanta are little chunks of information, Quantum computers divide up information into chunks and then process it at this most microscopic level. So when was it first realized that quantum, by applying quantum thinking to computers, we could do something quite different? Well, quantum mechanics is kind of weird, right? This is a technical term. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we have chunky things like particles, but particles also have waves that are attached to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, for instance, if I have an electron, it can be here, and it's got a wave that goes, looks like that. Or the electron could be over here, and it's got a wave that looks like that. But in quantum mechanics, it's perfectly okay to have an electron that's here and there at the same time. So it's a wave that looks like that. And this is some strange counterintuitive bit, or a quantum bit, a mm. qubit, where the bit can read both zero and one at the same time. And in the mid-1980s, David Deutsch of Oxford realized that you could uh, use this weird feature of quantum mechanics to perform computations in ways that classical computers could not. Can you give me some examples of the sort of thing that a quantum computer could do that a classical computer can't do? Sure. So uh, if I have a bit, you know, let's see how bits function in computers. It could be a bit of data, you know, zero or one in, in, uh, your, in a letter of your name or in a pixel on a screen, or it could be an instruction for a computer. So zero could mean do this, add two plus two, or do that, add three plus one. So if you have a quantum bit that's an instruction for a quantum computer and it says do this and do that simultaneously in some weird quantum way, both add two plus two and add three plus one at the same time. This is something that classical computers can't do unless you have separate processors that are actually adding two plus two and three plus one. In a quantum computer, the same set of electrons is adding two plus two and three plus one at the same time. So it's David Deutsch was the first to really see the potential of this sort of built-in parallel processing of quantum computers. But then building one is quite a, another matter. Um, Tell me a bit about how you build a quantum computer. Yeah, uh, the, the notion that you could actually build quantum computers uh, was kind of shocking when it came up. Um, Richard Feynman, who, the Nobel laureate who also did early work on quantum computing, when he talked about it, he said, nobody can imagine doing this and you'll think I'm crazy for even talking about it. But um, because of advances over the last 50 years in terms of how people can can uh, control the states of atoms and electrons and superconducting systems and ions and ion traps, it turns out that um, there are lots of different ways of building quantum computers and it turned out to be somewhat easier than people had thought. Um, uh, <clears throat> I made the first design for a quantum computer in 1993 and started working with people, with colleagues shortly afterwards to realize this. Um, a, a reasonable way of doing this is, so suppose you, your quantum bit is an electron or a proton, it could be spinning like that, we call that zero, spinning like that, we call that one, mm -hmm. or spinning like that, which is zero and one at the same time. I don't, <laughs> don't ask me how. <laughs> hey, quantum mechanics is weird, you know, that's just the way it is. Uh, I mean, many people who have Nobel Prizes in quantum mechanics, starting with Einstein, fundamentally don't believe in it mm -hmm. because it contradicts their intuition. So how, how could you perform logic operations? So the way ordinary digital computers work is they flip bits. Mm -hmm. So I have a bit that's zero, and I want to turn it into a one. So I, to do this with a proton in, an, in a molecule, I just tickle it with a microwave field, and the proton will gradually wiggle its way around from being zero to one. Mm -hmm. So that's, you can flip a bit, which is a, a not operation. Zero goes to one, and one goes to zero. And then you can, if you have two protons, they're sitting here, and I can put in another set of microwaves that will tickle this proton so that it will flip 
but only if this other proton is in the state zero. Mm -hmm. If the proton is like this, this won't flip. This is called a controlled knot operation, and uh, uh, it's a, a two-bit or two-qubit logic operation. But the way that ordinary computers work is you simply build up very complicated computations, a few bit flips at a time. So it turns out that, that being able to perform knot operations, being able to put qubits in the state zero and one at the same mm -hmm. time, and being able to do these controlled operations, if you can do them sequentially over many quantum bits, allows you to perform any quantum computation. So what are the main technical challenges we've had to overcome to build the first quantum computers? Um, you mean apart from our own ignorance? <laughs> apart from our own ignorance. <laughs> the, which is, ignorance is the ultimate technical challenge. <laughs> well, it, it's, um, you know, atoms are small and we are big. Mm -hmm. All right? So it's, it's a, uh, uh, and so it's actually quite hard to get our macroscopic information down to mm -hmm. this microscopic scale. Um, a few years ago, I was at my uh, cousin's wedding. She's a cultural anthropologist, and I was sacrificed to the table of anthropologists. And they asked me what I did, and I said, oh, my colleagues and I take atoms and molecules and we exploit their natural information processing ability to make them compute. And they're, of course, horrified because this is, this is a, uh, you know, colonialist and terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so then, then I realized, oh, okay, let me describe this differently. So we have these atoms, we tickle them with microwaves or with lasers, mm -hmm. and we basically massage them until they relax and are convinced that they, what they want to do is actually perform the computation for us. Um, it, it's hard to do, and uh, there are lots of errors involved, so you may flip this bit imperfectly instead of starting up and going all the way down, you flip it part of the way, which then will show up as an error in your quantum computation. Um, you have to deal with the fact that the environment is constantly bombarding your system with all kinds of perturbations, mm -hmm. which also can cause errors. So it's a, th these are hard technical problems. But in the end, they can be overcome. After this, uh, after this uh, wedding dinner, um, and uh, one of the anthropologists took me aside and put his arm around my shoulder and said, Seth, the next time you describe what you do, I suggest you say you empower atoms to compute. <laughs> so, <laughs> so with the pro proper technical expertise, you can empower atoms to compute. So Seth, in the commercial effort to empower atoms, and in fact we're, we're sitting in University College London where I know there's a lot of interest in, in actually using a real workable quantum computer, what's the state of the art at the moment? You know, what, can we, what can we do and what do you expect is going to be available in the next year or two? So uh, uh, around the world there are now thousands of people working on, on quantum computing, trying out various ways of building quantum computers. So you can store bits on you know, the spins of protons. Mm -hmm. You can store them on electrons. So electron here is zero, electron there is one, and electron here and there at the same time is zero and one at the same time. Um, you can store them on ions and ion traps. Ions are you know, charged atoms, and you, you trap them in kind of a cradle where they rock back and forth, and this rocking motion allows them to talk to each other. And then by zapping them with lasers in the right way and allowing them to talk with each other in this electromagnetic cradle, you can empower them to compute. Or, or a very common method of doing quantum computing is to take superconducting systems. Mm -hmm. So you have supercurrent going around a loop forever like that, we call that zero. And supercurrent going around the loop forever like that, we call that one. Mm -hmm. And supercurrent going around the, the loop clockwise and clockwise simultaneously, we call that zero and one at the same time. So you know you have a trillion electrons that are are going both clockwise and counterclockwise around this loop. Uh, again, don't ask me how that can be. I I just know that it's true because I've worked on these experiments with people. And what's happening right now <coughs> is very exciting, which is that for the first several decades of quantum computing, because of the intrinsic difficulties of em empowering atoms to compute and massaging them to try to to get them to perform logic operations and dealing with the effects of the environment. Quantum computers were limited to just a few quantum bits, you know, a half mm. a dozen or a dozen quantum bits. And now due to concerted efforts on the part of people like Google and IBM and Microsoft and Intel, and of course places, actually other places like Alibaba and Huawei are getting into this mm. mix as well. Now people have come up with ways to build larger and larger quantum computers and to scale them up 
to the point where it seems that it might even at some point be commercially viable. I've heard you talk about the universe itself being a giant quantum computer. What do you mean by that exactly? Well, so um, in my efforts to try to figure out how to, how to design and then build these first quantum computers, I realized that actually what's going on is that everything in the universe stores information. You know, every proton has spin. It stores a bit of information. Every electron has to be somewhere, here or there or here and there at the same mm -hmm. time. You know, every atom has to be either in its ground state or in its excited state. All of these can store and effectively register bits of information. And whenever two electrons bounce off of each other, those bits flip. Mm -hmm. Or whenever light comes in and excites an atom from its ground state to its excited state, its bits flip. So this bit flipping and processing of information at this quantum mechanical level is always going on and has been going on since the beginning of the universe. When we're building quantum computers, we're essentially kind of hacking in to this universal computation that's been going on since the beginning of time and just simply trying to guide this information processing to do things that we might find more interesting. Is there something special about living things in the way that they process information? So by regarding everything as a quantum information processor, do we get any special insights into life and living processes? Um, well, that's a very interesting question. So of course, everybody is quantum mechanical, just like everything is quantum mechanical. And quantum mechanics governs the laws of chemistry, which include uh, the laws of biology, you know, they governs how, how chemical reactions can take place, they govern the, they govern the copying of DNA, uh, they govern the firing of neurons in the brain. So all of this is quantum mechanical in nature. But the kind of special quantum weirdness that allows quantum computers to do funky things, um, this is easily destroyed in hot, wet environments, and our brains are hot, wet environment. <laughs> so for example, the neurons in our brains, when they fire, they're not in quantum superpositions mm -hmm. of firing and not firing. So our brains themselves are not processing information in an intrinsically quantum mechanical fashion. However, quantum mechanics does play a very important role in um, living systems. Uh, I visited UCL a few years ago to talk about quantum mechanics and photosynthesis. So mm -hmm. in photosynthesis, light comes in from the sun. It creates an exciton, particle of excitation, a particle mm -hmm. of energy in a chromophore, such as a chlorophyll molecule. The exciton then hops around from chromophore to chromophore. Um, but because it's quantum mechanical, it actually takes all possible paths through this photocomplex at once. And you can't understand the very high efficiency of energy transport and photosynthesis without delving into its intrinsically quantum mechanical nature. So nature has discovered all kinds of sneaky quantum tricks that, to make life work. Um, it's just, this is not what's going on at the level of human brains or consciousness. I, I think, you know, there, there's a tendency um, uh, to say, wow, you know, consciousness is strange and mysterious, quantum mechanics <laughs> is strange and mysterious, maybe they're the same yes. thing. Um, they're not. So Seth, what sort of things do you think quantum computers are going to deliver in the next decade or so? Well, Roger, it's a very exciting time for quantum computing because um, uh, now there's this kind of arms race between IBM, Microsoft, and Google to build larger scale quantum computers. You know, IBM said, well, we have a, a, a 49 qubit quantum computer, and now Google has a 72 qubit quantum computer. Um, and uh, uh, while that still doesn't sound very large as quantum computers go, that's large enough to do all kinds of things that you couldn't do on a classical computer. Um, one great application for quantum computers that people are, are already using these devices for is to understand quantum mechanics itself. You have a complex quantum mechanical system. It's in the same way that it's hard for human beings to understand what's going on in these systems, it's also hard for classical computers to simulate this. But on a quantum computer, um, using methods uh, suggested by Feynman and then developed by me and uh, by other people, you can actually simulate what's going on in these complex quantum systems, which could be very useful for problems like discovering new drugs, understanding what's going on in novel semiconductors, 
and just understanding the universe in general. Uh, we're hoping to, to simulate what happens when you fall into a black hole on a quantum computer Ouch. soon. <laughs> well, that's why it's better done in simulation. <laughs> yes. We wanted to do the real experiment, but the workplace safety people at MIT said we were not allowed to build a black hole in the laboratory. The fools, the fools, <laughs> holding back science. What are they thinking? <clears throat> so um, uh, the, uh, the killer app for quantum computation is code breaking. If you could build a large-scale quantum computer and correct all the errors that are occurring, um, you could break all the codes that we use to buy stuff over the internet. And uh, since uh, buying stuff over the internet is the basis for all economic activity, this would be a terrible thing for the globe because it would just come to a halt. Fortunately, that's not likely to happen for at least a decade or two decades or maybe never. Okay. But in the meanwhile, there are wonderful things that we can do. So for example, one application of these small quantum computers um, is to do machine learning, to look for patterns that are there in nature that are hard to uncover and understand. Mm -hmm. So um, classical computers are doing a wonderful job of this. They're much better at voice recognition software than they used to be. Um, they can recognize a picture of a kitten on the internet when they see it, which is amazing. Of course, the, the prior probability of a picture on the internet being a kitten is already very high, so <laughs> maybe it's not as impressive as it might be. But with quantum computers, just in the same way that quantum mechanical systems can generate patterns mm -hmm. that no classical device could generate, they can also recognize patterns that no classical device mm -hmm. could recognize. Mm -hmm. And the kinds of quantum computers that are being built now, you know, even with they just have 5,200 quantum bits, can actually both generate and recognize patterns that could never be recognized by a classical computer. And this might be very useful for all kinds of applications. One little follow-up to that. You, you talked about the dark side of quantum computing being code-breaking and really being able to tackle any code that we've developed at the moment. But isn't there a kind of light side to quantum communication being um, the way to send messages from A to B that are very difficult to intercept and eavesdrop on? Yes, so um, uh, one aspect of, of quantum information is its use in communication, in particular for secure communication, quantum cryptography as it's called. Um, and quantum cryptography relies on the fact that if you look at a quantum system, you mess it up. You mm. can't get away from that. Mm. Moreover, you can't copy an unknown state of a quantum system. The so-called no cloning theorem says that if you try to make a copy of some quantum information, you will A, mess it up, and you will fail, mm -hmm. B. <laughs> so this is used in communication to establish secure communication links where the two parties can be sure by looking at the communications back and forth that nobody's listening, and if somebody is, they can find out how much information they're getting, which will allow them to communicate securely. So not only does quantum me mechanics supply, you know, a problem, you know, disruptive technology which would break codes, but it also supplies a solution, a method for uh, uh, constructing provably unbreakable codes, assuming you believe in the laws of physics. Seth Lloyd, thank you very much. That was brilliant. And I really enjoyed talking about empowered atoms. <laughs> Let's go out and empower some atoms, Roger. <laughs> <laughs>